going to continue <clears throat> the uh, meditation on the subject of the areas uh, in which God does not want us uh, to be ignorant. And so we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that we referred to in our last session that begins with, Moreover, brethren, I would not have ye to be ignorant of Israel's history in which we are taught a great deal about God and his character and how he, the Almighty, looks upon certain transgressions, how he looks upon certain evils and his attitude toward sin in his people. We've been reminded of the fact that God does not want us to be ignorant about the Jews. What is their condition today as a, as a people, as a whole? And what is their future and so on? God does not want the believers in Christ to be ignorant of that subject. Then, too, God does not want us to be ignorant about the uh, charismatic movement of today. What were at one time true spiritual gifts, their purpose, their exercise, and their abuse, and their limited time, and so forth. Now, many Christians are confused because they do not know the word of God. Sometimes a pastor or uh, any, any person could uh, expose himself to a difficult situation by saying, well, we'll get together and if anybody has any, any question, I'll try to answer it and so forth. Well, surely uh, there'll be someone affected by some cult or some ism or some religion or something something that they've been going over in their own mind and, and they've, they've had, they have their prejudice and they've got their mind set and so forth and boof, they come along with a question uh, that the innocent uh, Christian who has exposed himself to be willing to answer just cannot uh, give an adequate answer to someone like that very, very quickly. But certainly, we ought to have enough in our background uh, from a knowledge of the Word of God so we'll, we'll not be ignorant of those spirituals that we read about uh, that persisted for a while in, uh, in Corinth and to see the contrast between what the Holy Spirit was doing then and the so-called charismatic movement today and the speaking in tongues. Then we also noticed something else that God did not want us to be ignorant of the fact that the Lord Jesus is coming to take us home to be with himself uh, to be ignorant of that re uh, robs us of great hope and, and joy in looking to the future what a glorious reunion that we're going to have there are other matters too to which we referred but Right now, we're going to go to the one that we did not have time with at the last session, and that is, he does not want the Christians to be ignorant of these specific sins uh, or evils, and there are five of them. And I think uh, that here are things that we easily dismiss as saying, well, there's no danger of that in my life. There is no danger of that in this church. There is no danger of that in my family. But God says, no, there is a danger. And I don't want you to be ignorant of this because something happened before. And these are things that you need to be alerted to because he says in verse 12, therefore, he that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. Do you think you're standing? We, we, we like to sing and standing on the rock and so forth. And we've been having some of that emphasis tonight in our song service. But you know, the Holy Spirit says, you think you stand. 
your your mind seems comfortable uh, you're at ease uh, you you feel calm and 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 safe in in your doctrine and your belief your position in Christ but there is something that can creep in something that can sneak in and I want you to know God's attitude toward that so that you do not cheat yourself of the uh, of the privileges and the opportunities uh, that you have to serve now I'm going to read those verses again in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 moreover brethren I would not have I would not that ye should be ignorant that all our fathers were under the school, uh, the cloud and all passed through the sea were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea did all eat the same spiritual food and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ but see here is the point now you you know that history you know what's happened and what many wonderful things God did for all this people but with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness now that's uh, a mild way of saying it isn't isn't it he was not well pleased and so they were overthrown in the wilderness and then he gives some examples of it which we want to learn now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted now that's one we're going to consider tonight neither be idolaters as were some of them as it is written the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play and immediately a certain time in Israel's history comes to mind does it not the time of the uh, making of the golden calf okay neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand now that's a lot of people over twenty three thousand actually uh, that's a lot of people what kind of a God is this what kind of a God is this you and I have to know the God of the Bible and be acquainted with his character uh, the reason so many people play fast and loose and play games with God and play games with the church play games with the ministry and, and play games with doctrine believe what they want to believe and leave out what they want to leave out and say what they feel like saying and, and so forth almost as though there was no discipline in their lives and the reason is they do not know who God is and don't think for one moment that God has changed because there are, the pages of the Bible have changed and you move on from Malachi uh, to Matthew. The God is the same. He has said in the very last book of the Old Testament, I am the Lord, I change not. Do you believe that? You see, he's writing this to impress the Christians that there are certain evils that can creep in to their lives without their consciously embracing it as right, hardly knowing it is there before it's there, but that they should know God's attitude and his intense hatred. Here were his own people. He had called them. He had rescued them. He had taken them out of Egypt. He had performed miracles before them. He had opened up the sea. He had fed them. He did so many, many things for them. And yet, this people that he said he loved, this people that he said he had chosen, this people that he said he would make an example before all the Gentile nations, and yet in one, at one time, 23,000. Yea, there were more than that, over 23,000. Paul refers to the 23 in one day. Now, we ought to learn something here. Verse 9, neither let us tempt Christ the, or put Christ to the test, push him, so to speak, 
as some of them also tempted him or tested, and were destroyed by serpents. Do you know how many? Do you know how many perished then? You know what a horrible thing was it? Oh, yes, God did use this to point out that people could be saved alive. They could be healed from snake bite. And you will recall that the Lord Jesus referred uh, to that as well. Uh, did he not? So for the spiritual lesson. But m we move on. Verse 10. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed by the destroyer. And if you l look up and back in the Old Testament, this particular event uh, that he has in mind, there were 14,700 of the people that God had chosen. He was whipping his own people. I know it's difficult. And I know that you can't explain this to a little kid. They, they can't grasp it. But I think that we as adults, as grown-ups, uh, and certainly though many of us are, are children, but we're old enough to read and to uh, think for ourselves to realize we have got to know the God of the Bible and to understand something of the time element. You will remember that Peter wanted us to make sure uh, that we understood something of the time element. Uh, Peter didn't want us to be ignorant of one fact among others, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, or a thousand years as one day. See, we are creatures of a limited, pressed in little bit of time as part of great eternity. And we need to understand something about our God. When a person becomes impatient, as in the case of Sarah, when she heard that uh, Abraham was going to have many descendants and yea, even heard that she herself uh, along in years would bear a son. She became very impatient as time went on. A year goes by, two years go by, three years go by, four years go by and there is no evidence of pregnancy. Five years go by, six years go by, and she's beginning to be impatient with God to whom a thousand years is at one day. You see, she needed to learn something and not be impatient with God. She made a big mistake, didn't she? She decided to help God out. She decided to do something to sort of get this, uh, this matter underway so that there would be descendants. And what a tragedy uh, that was to bring that slave girl into this uh, situation. And uh, the miseries are with us to this day, as you know, in the Middle East. Now, verse 11, all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are written for our admonition. Now there's a purpose in it. Upon whom the ends of the ages are come. And as we mentioned earlier, when he was writing to the Corinthians, it was the beginning of that time, and we are at the end of, the, of that particular uh, time. And the warning, wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth, Take heed lest he fall. Do you get it? It's so easy to think uh, that certain uh, evils will not come into my life. Certain evils will not come into my family. Certain evils will not come into the church. So he's warning them, you, 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 you think you're standing. So far as your own mind is concerned, so far as your logic and your reasoning and your intelligence is concerned, you, you feel comfortable. You feel that you're, you're standing. But take heed. It's possible for you to fall. And we go to verse 6 where we have, first of all, the reminder not to be craving uh, evil things. You know, one by one, as we take up these matters, a person might say, oh, I don't crave any evil things, and I can't imagine myself craving anything evil. And sometimes 
the uh, natural mind only sees uh, what is evil by what the society around about him calls evil or or the culture in which he lives calls it evil or if the majority of Christians look upon something as evil uh, that's the limit of his thinking of or his knowledge and then you have immature Christians who are nitpickers who look at so-called small things that are not of moral consequences in order to find fault perhaps one with another oh he does this he does that and and say to themselves oh I wouldn't do those evil things but not understanding what is meant here now the the Holy Spirit for example uh, convicts us of uh, such evils as competition and greed and wanting to grab something for ourselves and we're talking about improving ourselves or material gain you go back to the example in the Old Testament and you'll find that this people once delivered from Egypt look back with fondness upon some of the creature comforts uh, that they had which gradually began to be taken away from them but they looked back to the things that they could uh, eat they were talking about leeks they were talking about uh, onions they were talking about some of those things that just sort of added a little zest uh, to the meal they were thinking of those things which in themselves were not evil but they belonged to an evil system and they were a part of a system from which God was going to remove them. I wonder how many stop to think about those things. You know, God, the, the son said, ye cannot serve God and mammon. And here in our affluent society, it's possible for Christians to become so wrapped up and so involved in, in, in wanting to get more and, and having more and having more they do not see it they do not realize it they feel oh if I could buy one more thing if I could add some new furniture if I could do this oh then I'll be so happy not realizing that while there's nothing wrong about that particular item of furniture or whatever in itself it's e evil but that the Holy Spirit is talking about here is that these people in ancient times were to be satisfied with what God gave them. You see the point. You know, a man is never satisfied anyway. Hey, we're reading about this fellow in, uh, he was president of the Philippines. He thinks he still is. And, and he... Uh, they think it runs into them billions. Now, wouldn't you think that he'd be satisfied with a million? And, and, and how many pairs of shoes that his, uh, his wife had? And she only had two feet. And how many places could she go to? And why, why get more? Why get more? Well, we look at that. We say, oh, man is greedy and all of that. But you know, we're like that. We're made of the same stuff. And this is what he's talking about to grasping for that which in itself is not wrong to make an investment but you're not trusting and relying on what God provides. Now if he enables you to buy something at a bargain he enables you to make a, a, a good investment I'm sure that this passage is not going to bother you. But the Holy Spirit does speak to each one of us about the competition, wanting to get ahead, wanting to maybe dominate somebody else's life and so forth because we think that's, that's part of it. And certainly material gain. You cannot serve God and mammon. So when you begin to think about these five things, you, you say to yourself, and go to God in prayer and say, Lord, I don't want to be guilty of lusting after things that are evil because I don't seek them for your glory. 
Then another thing he mentions in, in, in 7 is idolatry. Now remember that this is not limited to figurines or, or statuary or icons or pictures. Uh, we are told in God's book to flee from idolatry. Did you know that over uh, 20 times in the New Testament we have <clears throat> statements concerning idolatry among Christians? There's a great deal said about uh, idolatry. And uh, we are to keep ourselves from evils, uh, uh, from, from evil things, including idols. He specifically says, keep yourselves from idols. Well, you know, it's so easy for us to assume that, well, I don't want anything to do with, with statuary and, and, and things like that. But why should he have to tell us, keep yourself from it and flee from it? Almost as though the idols were chasing you. So, you see, there's something to think about here. In connection with it, does not the Apostle Paul, I think it's to the Colossians, state that covetousness is idolatry that's right covetous is idolatry not just as bad as or similar to but it really but it really is and at certain times and certain seasons we begin to become more aware of the fact how Christians become enamored with that and yet it's so easy to think oh it doesn't touch me I'm not involved in it. Then, if someone comes along and, and, and enlightens us or preaches about some of these things, and then we're, we're just like a little kid that can't stand to have a toy taken away from him. Then he mentions also in verse 8, fornication. Um, now what he's talking about here is not limited to physical uh, acts of immorality. But you know that there is a spiritual fornication as well. Of course, flesh is flesh, and human beings are human beings. And they have uh, appetites, and they have urges, and those things that can lead to actual uh, immoral practices. But we need what we ought not forget that there is spiritual fornication, spiritual fornication uh, uh, as well, uh, so that uh, th there is a recognition of the fact that it's possible to be unfair with God and to cheat on God by allowing ourselves to have that kind of mixture in our thinking violating uh, the law uh, of separation you will remember when the apostle Paul spoke about uh, idolatry in the previous verse uh, he said pinpointing the incident that the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play how many recognize that in so much of the social activity among Christians there is, after all, idolatry. And so that when we come to the matter of fornication, I think it's so easy to dismiss that as saying, well, that, that pertains to <clears throat> the, the, the physical, uh, but forget that it refers to the spiritual as well. Remember what James wrote? Ye adulterers and adulteresses. What a term to use to those to who, believers to whom he's writing. He says, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Friendship with the world. You are to be separate and you are to be distinct. So now you see, we, we begin to understand more what is spiritual fornication. God has said there are certain things that you're not to be a part of. You're not to be identified with. Well, of course, we haven't time in this discourse to, to go into the various uh, applications of God's law of, uh, uh, of separation. But 
It's to be completely separated unto him and in no way a part of something else. What happened in Israel's case, of course, was the affinity with, with Moab. And on the physical level, you had the men and the women not only fraternizing, but entering into sexual relationships as well, including marriage. And God hated that because he had told them not to do this. Well, we, we certainly have uh, warnings in the New Testament not to be unequally yoked together uh, with unbelievers. You see, that's the point, because that becomes the sin of, of fornication. And then, too, beyond that, there was the religious uh, fornication, because they began to become uh, awed and, in, and, 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 and excited about the uh, idol worship of the Moabites. And uh, that was the incident, you know, where God had to kill so many of his own people. Uh, to me, this is, it's scary, and it ought to be. Uh, but having taught Old Testament for so many years, I, I find that uh, my own personal being is not really happy uh, with some of those things that you have to uh, read about. And yet it's all so we'll know who God is, the one whom, whom we serve. You know that the, the apostle writes that friendship with the world is enmity with God. And love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You see, it's a matter of values as well as, as simple priorities. So we ought to take these warnings. I think that uh, today we have very few Christians who understand God's law of separation. Uh, some uh, only understand it in the sense of, you know, don't play bets on horse, place bets on horses or, you know, things of that nature. Not realizing that friendship with the world is enmity with God. And that we have to take our stand when we find people calling themselves Christians, calling themselves <clears throat> evangelists or prophets or something like that, and they are not <clears throat> teaching straight down the line, we have to separate ourselves from them. We cannot be a part of them. We don't want to be guilty of a spiritual fornication. In verse 9, you have another strong expression, and that is with regard to tempting Christ. And a, a free translation is putting Christ uh, to, to the test. Putting Christ to the test. What does that mean? I think every boy and girl... And every one of us uh, was there at one time. So I guess that applies to all of us. Uh, have had it in ourselves to see what we could get away with at home. Mommy and daddy, they had their rules and they had their regulations. Uh, but uh, we felt a little bit hemmed in, you know, at times. And so we'd try to push and see what we could get away with, how, how, far we could, how far we could go. And sometimes we'd been told how to act when company comes, and, and we knew how to behave, see? But we knew we wouldn't get a slap when the company was there, so we'd see how far we could go, how far we could go. Well, now this is, this is it. This is the, what Israel did how far they could go in disobedience to what God had revealed without being hit. But they were hit, and they really were hit hard. You see what he's saying? You think you stand. Look out, you can fall in any one of these categories because if you're not careful, if you don't take the warning, if you're not concerned about yourself, it'll happen to you. And remember then 
that it isn't something that God is going to be pleased with. It's something that God detests. And he detested it so much that he had to slay some of his own people. And when you know how much God hates the violation of the law of separation, when you know how much God hates trifling in idolatry, and when you know how much God hates becoming enamored of the things uh, of this world, then you say, oh, Father, forgive me. I don't want in any way to bring dishonor uh, to your name. Do, do you see that? You know, being attracted to the world in whatever area can happen to anyone. You know, there was a man who was very close to the Apostle Paul. Very close to him. And spent time with him. But Paul had to write about him and writing to Timothy. He said, Demas, Demas has forsaken me. And he's departed. He's forsaken me. He was part of the ministry. He was part of Paul's help. He was one of Paul's helpers. He wanted to learn. He wanted to grow. He wanted to share. He wanted to do everything he could to help Paul, the apostle. But he took off. And why? Why did he go? He knew that there were problems in the ministry. He knew that there would be hardships. Uh, he knew that not everyone would believe the gospel. Uh, he had been with Paul enough to know some of the great doctrines uh, uh, that he taught. And so he would be aware of the fact that you're not coming to a heathen world with a message that they're going to embrace with enthusiasm. And there would be difficulties. And Paul himself was imprisoned. Now, Demas knew all of this. But it wasn't the difficulties in, in, in being in Christian service. What was it? Demas hath forsaken me. Why? Having loved this present evil world. That's why. His heart went to the present age and what it could provide and what it could give. You see, it can happen. It can happen. The last one he mentions, and my time is gone, is neither murmur ye. There are 20 references in the Pentateuch to specific areas of, of uh, uh, murmuring uh, as the cardinal sin uh, in Israel, the evil of a complaining spirit because things weren't going just the way they wanted them to go. And we can understand that because that is that they wouldn't be happy with some of the circumstances because you and I wouldn't want to live too long uh, in that Sinai, uh, on that Sinai uh, 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 peninsula with a, a great deal of uh, routine and sameness and, and so forth. We can understand that. They didn't have all of the creature comforts uh, that they would like to have. But the evil was that they complained that they murmured. Not only that, but they murmured against God's men, Moses and Aaron. They murmured against them and tried to cut them down. At times, they had a, a, an attitude developed where, where they were ready to stone these men and even became so erratic in their thinking that they even suggested, let's get somebody that can bring us back to Egypt. How foolish. How foolish. It's hard to figure out the, the, the human mind when it begins to go the wrong way. But the most serious part of it all is that God took it personally. He took it personally and he made it very plain and told Moses to explain to this people, you haven't been murmuring against, against situations. You haven't been murmuring against men. Your murmuring has been against God. And, and he took a great uh, offense at that. Uh, on one occasion, because of it, there were 14,700 that perished, as I told you uh, earlier. You see how important it is that we be not ignorant of who God is. And we be not ignorant of God's attitude uh, toward uh, such departures from his sweet and perfect uh, uh, will. But... 
uh, we need not be ignorant of, of his hatred, but neither should we be ignorant of how subtle these things are. So I, I'm going to ask you, would you go to God in prayer tonight perhaps before you retire or <clears throat> when you can have some time alone or in the days ahead? Try to keep it in mind. I think that's very important. And go over these five things. Say, Lord, I don't want to be guilty of this. May thy Holy Spirit show me <clears throat> if any of this is creeping in to my life because I don't want uh, any part of it. Well, that's all we have time for now. The time is gone, and, and thank you for listening, and thank you for uh, allowing me to present this at this time. Let's pray. Father, we thank thee for thy word, and now we pray that thou wilt sanctify thy word in our lives by enabling us and causing us to be discerning and accepting. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.